uh, on this lecture, I decided I was going to give it maybe seven minutes ago, but I think it'll be a good one. <laughs> uh, I think what we'll do, as bad as it might sound, but also how it might work out pretty well, is I'm going to thumb around through blocks and talk about them, and you can take notes on it. Um, and I promise, full disclosure the entire way through, because now that I'm done in debates, my success is y'all's success, and vice versa, even if my role in that is only like 0 0.0052 something or other. Um, yeah, roughly exact. So, I don't think that too much of this lab, other than Martin, or not lab, too much of this camp, other than uh, Martin's lecture on prep time, or preparing, really delves a whole lot into this. And what I was thinking about was twofold along the way here um, with respect to the value and the importance of block writing. The first of which is that I don't think anyone has room to be snobbish over block writing, what it looks like, what your files look like. You kind of get to do whatever you want, but at the same time that carries a responsibility that is institutionally based. Things that you write might be in your team's Dropbox moving forward for the foreseeable future, and that means that the quality of the back files that exist within your program are based on the writing that you've done. Uh, the second point of which, and really it's just a muddled same first point, is that um, if you're writing blocks in any capacity, you're already doing more than like 50% of the community, and those that don't write blocks will suffer the long-term consequences of that unless they're a super brilliant genius. But the reality is most people think they're super brilliant geniuses but are not, in fact, that. So I'm going to log on to Western's Dropbox, and I'm not going to feel bad showing you guys some of the stuff that has been crafted. One, because it's not that great, and two, because uh, I wrote or put in a significant portion here. And thinking about the process of writing blocks, it dawned on me as someone that, I mean, not to brag, but you all must have come in here because I have some semblance of credibility. Done over 300 rounds in my career, and more of those rounds were won or lost at the BDC or late summer nights writing blocks than anything else, which shows you the tremendous importance and the two examples that I can think of off the top of my head. And one of them isn't even really block writing so much as it is illustrating the importance of thinking of these arguments ahead of time was this. Last summer, we were all asked on Western's team to write a criticism. And so I was like, oh, should be easy enough. Pick an author, find some back files, and write something on them. I ended up chewing on some agamben for a couple weeks. I read The State of Exception and large chunks of Homo Saker. Maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong. And um, I ended up deciding that I wanted nothing to do with it. But what I did get from it was writing impact turns to agamben. And at NPTE, a solid six, seven months later, round one of NPTE elims, the other team reads an agamben af. And you'd have to think that the utility in reading something like an Agamben AF is you would be hoping to catch the other team off guard. It's something they don't know or you wouldn't expect them to know it half as well as you did. The reality of that round was I read impact turns. We won on a procedural, but I'm pretty sure we could have won on those impact turns too. And that's what Nigel told me. And it was just one small example of the really, really tedious process of block writing that can help you so much down the road. And the... The thought process that I was telling you all about and the invaluable nature of that definitely comes into play when I think of a round that we had with Budak and Parker and debated Virilio. I probably know maybe that much more about Virilio than any of you that haven't read it. And it's because I talked with Adam Krell about what answering Virilio would look like that I have that now. Or that I knew how to answer or read answers to it that was enough to get us the ballot, even if we might not have deserved it. The point being... If you write blocks, um, that's probably a good thing. Now, let's take a look at some of the things that uh, my team blocked out or that I put into the Dropbox 
I mean, you can take a rough idea of things that you should be blocking and what those blocks might look like in an ideal scenario. I think that ideally any sort of blocks that are written have to be accessible to you. Obviously, they should be things that you could sit down with and memorize or regurgitate to yourself off the top of your head. Like an actor learning to memorize lines, memorizing blocks will make you all the more better. When I give uh, a, my 130 lecture on the MG Advanced, a majority of what I'm going to be talking about is why being a block monster is the way to be, and we'll talk more about that then, but for now, let's take a look at some files. Um, unrelated fun fact for you all, as I kind of plunker around in search of what I am looking for, um, where was I going with this? Oh, the number of policy back files that you can learn impact turns from as part of developing your block repertoire is an invaluable resource and tool, but shouldn't be used as a clutch. There's nothing that can, so can compensate for creativity, and indeed, telling you all to be block monsters might sound counterintuitive, but as the lecture I give later will posit to you, it is when the happy marriage of Billy Block Monster and uh, Crazy Kenny come together that you are able to win not only rounds, but the unexpected rounds too, and indeed, 75% of Parley is predicated off of the unexpected and uh, things within Parley that are all going wrong, the audibles and the, and the like. Uh, oh, that's mine, not team. Oh, BTB, don't tell my team or Western that uh, I'm showing you guys blocks. They'll take it the wrong way. Um, yeah. Someone, someone will probably tell on me, but I didn't give you any. Any questions so far? Anything people would like to me to talk about specifically? No? All right. Uh, 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 Actually, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, once we go through examples or whatever, I think it'd be really useful to try and explain your mindset and when you're like coming up with a block. Like, oh, like for a really generic example, like, oh, Cap is good. Let me think. Like, why is cap good? Medicine or whatever, like that kind of like process. Oh, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah, here we go. It's the folder labeled blocks and stuff. Uh, not that. It's old. I'm really sorry that this is so unorganized. It's the same thing. Sorry. Um, okay, so thinking and looking through this all simultaneously. A lot of the thought process that I've had in going through or writing blocks, especially if you're an MG writing blocks or an MO writing blocks, is two things. The first of which is con conciseness. Any blocks that you're writing, it's cool to have big fat blocks, but it only matters in a world in which you were able to spit it out in a timely fashion. For example, when learning T or learning to answer T efficiently, what I would have Kristen do is Kristen would read a T shell, and every time I would read answers to it, I would give myself no more than a minute to do so. And so even the, pra the, the practice of practicing reading your blocks, and for that matter, cutting down on fat, waste, and inefficiency is in and of itself a good thing to be doing uh, continuously. Uh, no, that's still not what I want. Uh, yes, okay, here we go. Uh, whoop. There we go. All right, so this is actually something that I ended up writing the summer of a couple of years ago. And you'll notice that, like, there's nothing particularly special about all of these things. And I was actually thinking about this the other day. I sat in this very same room last year while Megan gave a lecture on the MG. And the reality of the lecture was all of them, or most of the explanations were very basic, very straightforward explanations of the ways that we go about answering each position. And it's kind of like the secret ingredient is, there is no actual secret ingredients. The process of learning and memorizing each of these little things and doing it particularly well and executing will serve you better than any one moment within your debate career can teach you. These are all just things that I've come up with or that I came up with 
in conjunction with my coach, and we decided these are things that I had to have memorized from a blog writing standpoint to execute. And you can see it goes from everything as basic as conditionality bad to things like answers to fairness to um, turns to criticism, some of which aren't read at all anymore, like, well, or at least are read super rarely. And it's the reality of block writing that there is a mundane nature to it. It's half of these things I never read, much less thought about. They all went away from my head. And as you can see, I put a lot of time into doing something very basic. And it's kind of cool to think that in writing all of this, the intent wasn't to be revolutionary. Very few people will be revolutionary in their block writing. The intent was to internalize the arguments to grasp or glean an understanding of the way these arguments functioned. And even if they're only vaguely fresh in my head, I'm, I was far more familiar moving into that, or into that season than I was ever before with these same arguments. And things as silly as reminding myself why extra topicality is bad is the difference between winning an out round and not, as mundane and repetitive as this lecture may seem at times. Um, in terms of the process, Benny, it was kind of like, um, especially in, because lots of theory things you can find already, and it's just kind of like the process of understanding what your interpretations want to look like, and then, you know, things like lit, predictability, and limits are all going to be the same thing. But the fact that you've gone through the process of repeating that thing and having it down is one thing. And then the next step would be when you're blocking out things like positions that other teams have read, then it becomes a matter of conceptualizing or thinking of impact turns or the best ways to do it. And then from there, you can think of the best thing for the next speech to say. Uh, file that I could pull up for you all at the end if you are interested. Uh, team, I won't say the name up since this is going to be recorded. We have, or we got lots of blocks from them that um, was just basic shit. Impacts to diseases. Impact turns to diseases. Explanations of what in an ideal world the PMR should be going for. And it's like Putting that level of thought and attention to detail into the files that you're writing or the answers that you're writing will put you the next step ahead. And it's the silliest thing because it can be done with teammates or it could be done by yourself. I always prefer to do it by myself because that's the way that I remember things is if I have to write them out myself. Um, in an ideal world, more of the things that I had written would have included things like the best PMR strategies in the event that this argument is conceded. Just general shit like that. Um, in terms of writing answers out to uh, various positions, that's, or, or the, the process, you can see that what I would do on things like CAP or other sorts of criticisms is I was like, look, I've already written out my perm answers. My perm answers are going to be pretty consistent regardless of the criticism. Likewise, my framework is going to be the same, which I have on different docs and sheets of papers. What then becomes important in answering any of these things is to highlight the impact terms that I want to be reading. Makes sense that very quickly over the course of an afternoon, you can knock out writing answers to just about 20 to 30 different criticisms, if you can think of that many off the top of your head. If not, then the internet is a tremendous resource for doing so. And it's like, boom. Um, Kenny and Klaus read uh, Spanos. <laughs> All I need going into that round, or even off the top of the dome, because this isn't useful to me in generating the unpredictable, is four impact turns. I read four impact turns, preferably ones of death. I read my framework, I read the perms, and that's it. It's like that's every round you will ever have with a criticism. Likewise, um, we have a different doc on here that I won't be pulling up. Uh, sitting down with Colin Patrick, we blocked out what we would do in every hypothetical scenario um, involving different counter plans, common strategies for all the actors, common strategies for picks. Hint, the common strategy for picks did not often involve reading picks bad. Although, sometimes it did, but that went poorly. Um, 
in any case, uh, the, the point of this is the more that you sit down and the more you tinker with it, the more you're going to be able to build your own repertoire. Would it be helpful with you all to discuss in just like a generic list things that should be blocked out in one capacity or another? Yeah, okay. Man, it's only been 14 minutes. Whoops. <laughs> um, all right. So, obviously, in everybody's, re or we'll go speech by speech and list things that should be in everybody's repertoire, written down somewhere or just straight up off the dome. So, the PM. Depending on the type of round you're in and what you expect your opponent to read, it's you might have a framework that you read every round. You might have impact framing arguments that you're also prepared <laughs> to read. And I think that you're going to notice a trend with what most of what I'm telling you to block out as it is right now. It's like, yeah, we have one of those. At a certain point, and it was Adam Krell that once told me this, the distinction between a good debater and a great debater, particularly going from the summer into the season, is somebody that going into the next day or going into, you know, day one of the tournament that doesn't need to spend their time writing cap turns during prep time, they have those things memorized already. And it sounds like far more of a daunting task than it is, I promise you. Um, so, impact framing arts. You probably want to have impacts also memorized. The number of new debaters that we get on the Western team that proclaim, I really want to learn these new impacts. And then they get super into learning all about nuclear war and how that leads to extinction. And they write all these things out and it's just tremendously fun to watch. And it reminds you of the little things that I think many people don't do anymore. Um, anyone else have anything that prime ministers should probably have memorized? Oh, okay. I guess one thing that I would add to you all that will certainly make you all even greater debaters than you already are, no sarcasm intended, merely campiness, pre-tournament. One of the biggest things that um, really changed my debate trajectory, um, and again, I don't mean to toot my horn, I'm just like trying to pump you all up on the mere ideas of these things, is um, a couple years ago, my partner and I made a concerted effort every day, or not every day, every Thursday before we would leave for a tournament to sit just down the hall in that crummy little squat room or in that comm facility lounge next door. We'd eat fast food and we'd sit on our computers and we would read the news and we would divide up blocks. We would say, all right, B-Silk, you're gonna write econ arguments. B-Silk would write business confidence high, business con low, general econ, and for the coaches' uh, point in all this, Kristen would make sure that we had everything covered and we had this big comprehensive list. This big daunting thing where half of it would be unpredictable or nobody would read politics the entire debate, but we felt ready or comfortable moving into the next day. Politics, a uh, thing you should all go to if you don't already when researching the politics debate is GovTracker. GovTracker is gold. Instant arguments as to why it's not on the dockets, why there's no chance that it passes now, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, before the tournament, make an effort to read the news. Get the Economist app. Student discounts, pretty clutch. Foreign Affairs is a little more manageable. They are 20 bucks for a year or a six month subscription. Um, you can put them on your Kindle, handy PDFs, share them with your team and they only come out quarterly. Most of you have library resources that you can access each of these things from. Um, I think one of the best examples that I can think of off the top of my head as to when I found obscure news reading to be particularly helpful is I was doing a practice round once with uh, one of my coaches and he read this position I wasn't expecting on India-Russia relations and off the top of my head, based entirely off of a headline that I had seen when skimming the news, 
I was able to make the argument that relations between them were in fact high because they'd come to a pipeline agreement. So always be sure to be, uh, not agreements, um, always be sure in pre-tournament blog writing to update your relations, as silly and regressive as that becomes with Israel and other countries. Um, in addition to this, a good way to conceptualize or think of how you can break these things down and with a team, certainly, you can divide up the duties as you go and be like, you're going to be responsible for this region all the time, and I'm going to take Africa. Uh, I mean, I personally am of the opinion that, one, you're not going to learn as much from that because they're only going to be writing something down for their purposes, or, you know, they'll remember it, but odds that you're going to internalize that in the same way are kind of silly. And two... Western debate on the whole is littered with examples of we're going to update these files or these shared Google Docs all year, um, which I think is ambitious, particularly if your team is scattered or you don't want to <laughs> depend on other people as you go along. So keep that in mind in divvying up the duties. Um, well, duties. Um, so <laughs> other cool thing, pre-tournament that... I just thought of that isn't actually cool, but maybe it's just cool if you fixate on debate stuff, is thinking of or finding apps and news sources that are particularly badass for your news thirsting quest. The app that I used in this past year, and then I recommended to some other people as well, that is both available on the Android platform and the Apple platform, is um, it's called News Republic. almost had to look at my phone cool thing about the News Republic app is they will let you filter things down into sections. It's basically like you get to Google section off your news based on the areas that you want. So in my News Republic, I had a specific news feed devoted to Asia, the Asian economy, China, the South China Sea. And I kid you not, they have filters within this app that are as focused as the South China Sea or the... East China Sea, whichever uh, of those two you want. And it's cool to flip through it, and it's one of those things where one of the best processes in learning to become a better block monster is every bit of news and information that you're reading, you're internalizing it, or you're thinking of it as, this is probably a uniqueness argument, this is a baller impact scenario. And it's once you get into that process that all of this just becomes secondary dropping junk onto a Word document, and that's how you become a better block monster, if you will. Continuing on to this generic list, unless I'm missing anything on the PM, we'll talk about things the LO should be memorizing, or in this case, writing down and crafting for their blocks. I'm of the opinion that every LO should have at least two criticisms that are their audibles. Things that you were able to shell off, off the dome, goes anywhere from three to five minutes that is ready at a minute's notice. Uh, things like your hedge turns and your cap turns. Um, all the things that I was showing you on the list already in the thing labeled generics and blocks. These are things you need to be thinking of ahead of time and have ready to go. Maybe you know an uh, um, anecdote you all might enjoy. BDC a few years ago, uh, B Silk and I went into a round when the resolution was uh, believe in America, believe in Mitt Romney. <laughs> and Boise State gets up and they start talking about how great the Republican Party is. And we're like, what? And they were like, irony, dog. Um, after that round, we had to sit down and write answers to irony. I mean, it's like the list of things to block and write out is ongoing and forever long. Um, when we debated George and Sterling a couple of years ago, they read poetry, and we lost. And so we had to go back, and we had to write answers to poetry. Likewise... Um, Emily and McKay in this past year at Whitman 
shook everything up, and they read hip hop. And so after Whitman that weekend, went back to the squad room and we said, Kenny, help me write answers to hip hop. And we sat there and we went over it and over it. And now I feel at least 10% more confident that I could answer a hip hop performance piece in one capacity or another. And a lot of these things, I don't know, I find it deeply humorous, and I'm certainly among the guilty parties in all this. The number of resources that you have at your disposal to be scouting and observing other teams as you're going. All of your computers have video on them. Why not get a video of a team that you know you're going to be hitting down the road and you want to beat? They'll all read the same blocks and the same arguments. Why not get ahead with that? And obviously that's more ambitious than most people are than not, but I don't know, you guys could start swapping videos with your buddies down in California or up in the Pacific Northwest, make it a real trading card game. That'd be super neat, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. If, you got, if you're from a team that doesn't have like a lot of resources or coaches, they don't have a lot of space, like criticisms or certain like impact arguments, there are resources online that have like blocks already out of that are specifically made. The Open Evidence Project is what I'm talking about. If you just Google that online, those are all policy cards and files, but they all have like answers to cap, answers to span, those answers to the code being a hack. All those arguments that you can just Google and there are cards, and then those could be sources to go into. Right. I made vague reference to that earlier when I was talking about the number of online resources at your disposal for things like that. Um, as you can see, what you would do in theory if you were to go through those files, some of those files power tagged as hell. What you have to do is you have to find what you want from the arguments, make your own tag, and add your warrants as you go. As you can see here, we have a claim with three separate warrants as to why the argument is true. So that's the extraction process that goes along with that. Um, so memorizing those things. Um, in terms of online resources, um, I mean, you all have seen on net benefits the number of videos that you can watch of other people, the number of lectures, that um, you can get your hands on. Kenny, t Kenny referenced open evidence. In terms of some of these much older criticisms, you can definitely just fucking Google the author and the words policy backfile. And five <laughs> or six things will pop up. You don't even need to use open evidence to do so. And, I mean, I'm obviously the biggest broken record to say this, but it's just all about the amount of time and thought that you put into this far more than what you actually end up putting down on a sheet of paper. The MG should have things like conditionality memorized, um, what else? Framework, answers to CPs, Alt, actors, picks, packs, floating, uh, well, no, that's, that's K's. K's, I'm like, floating picks for when Lewis and Clark creates their Lacan shell. Uh, agent counter plan answers. And obviously, um, what you read for each of those is going to be drastically similar, and that's where block writing becomes particularly useful, is it becomes a shell that you can repeatedly fill in. You know, you have your PTSD. Anyone not know what PTSD stands for? What does it stand for? Uh, permutation, theory, solvency, disadds. That's the process by which you want to be answering every counter plan, generally in that order because you can do it straight down. And all of your permutations are going to vary based on what they read. A uh, good example of this would be if somebody were to read a consult counter plan. Um, in that case, the permutation to that would be something to the effect of what we would say was perm do both, 
the, so the argument underneath of that, the permutation net benefit, is a double bind. Either uh, consult is normal means, which means that the permutation is legitimate, or consult, consult is not normal means, but it becomes that way vis-a-vis -vis the plan action, which means that every time you do it, you have to be... Uh, or you have to consult them over the matter. You would have to consult China or they'd be mad on anything involving that in the future. From there, you read disadvantages about why a consult counterplan would collapse hedge. And all of that is just straight up off the dome. And it's not science. It's not special when you hear it from anybody. It's whether or not they took the time to write that out. So, I mean, you can see that, like, a lot of it becomes form formulaic. Writing answers to criticisms or blocks might involve you writing at the top three or four sentences explaining what the author's main ideas is and explaining the ways in which to attack it. When I found ways to answer Agamben in my own Agamben quest last summer, what a strange name or a really bad summer camp, um, <laughs> there was a file from Arizona Debate Institute, the college policy camp down in Arizona, and there was a brief section on the first page of it explaining, yo, to answer Agamben is no different than reading your state good turns. And it's just kind of like, huh, that makes a lot of sense. And from that point on, I will always remember that. Finding accessible ways to craft and tailor your blocks will make you a better block monster in the long term. So we have all those arguments that the MG should be memorizing and coming up with and something that going into the season you should have ready. I mean, think about it this way. How much of a waste of time is it in prep to write out some of these things? They're pretty basic, they're not tremendously complicated, and if you've been doing the activity enough, then one or two lines, like even like, what I would end up doing is, I'm not saying that this will always come off the dome, and organizationally speaking, some people straight up aren't able to do that. But when somebody does read a specific type of counterplan or critique, and it's like almost taking a test, I'm kind of reaching as far as I can to take those arguments, and I'm maybe writing one or two words when I'm going down the flow in the MG, to remember to read it or answer it in this way. And that is... Infinite, it is infinitely more important for you to be reading about the topic, preparing for your case, understanding the nuances and spikes, helping your partner add those things, helping your team add those things, than it is for you to say, I'm too busy writing out answers to old actor counterplans, or China. And it's like half of the debate takes place long before the debate. That same list that I was telling you all about, that same attention to news reading ahead of time, puts you just that much farther ahead. It's funny, we talk about Parley as a 20 minute prep time thing. The reality is, between having coaches and teammates and access to all of these things, and knowing that the topic will come somewhere from the news, makes this far more than a 20 minute prep time activity in the long term. And the very best debaters are, or the very best debaters, the ones that get speaker awards, the ones that blow you away with how fast they are, those are the ones that spent their summer hours slaving away on files like moon mining. And it's like that one instance, you also get really, really excited to hear it after you haven't done or seen anything of it. It's like, God damn it, I spent a week reading this stupid book that nobody cares about, and it'll never be applicable except for that one speech where I get to get up for eight minutes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Emo should have... Does everyone understand what I mean when I write that you should be reading disads to counterplans? Well, most of you. Okay, cool. Um, if not, a disadvantage to the counterplan... It's almost like cheating if you think about it in the abstract. People spend five plus minutes in prep time writing out a disadvantage. Disadvantages to the counter plan are half-assed, three or four arguments, and they get just as much weight and credence on your opponent's 
largest piece of offense in the round. So read disadds to the counter plan. Don't be too gung-ho with it. It makes more sense to read one than three of them, because in all likelihood, if you're reading a disad worth beans, then uh, they won't be able to answer it, or they at least won't have thought about it. So keep that in mind. Um, MO, you might, yeah. Um, we put all of these on the counterplan page, like uh, the PTSD. We put that on, on the same page for like having the judge blow it. Um, that varies based on stylistic things. Obviously, if you're the MG, well, I, I guess I was a bit of a lazy MG, and that it was just kind of like, doesn't really matter how I write it down, I only have to give the speech, and then my flow doesn't matter too much, because my partner's flow of what I'm saying is infinitely more valuable than anything I have on this sheet. Not to mention the fact that I'm not speaking again, sometimes I would have to write it out as a reminder to myself to go through that process, and I found that important, but it's kind of like the more times you debate a counter plan, the more intuitive it is, um, if that makes any sense. Um, so the MO is an example of when you would want to have extensions blocked out. Um, for a criticism that B. Silk and I would read often, took like a million times before we actually wrote out, or he actually wrote out, well, well I'll, I'll say we shoulder the, or share the blame. Uh, common answers to things that we would hear every time. I mean, this is where with criticisms, you're coming up with front lines to the most generic of generic answers. Maybe St. Mary's debates San Diego all the time, and you know that Alexander James is going to read these very specific answers, and you've got a video of him doing it. That's when you and Carmen would sit down and you would write down the five or six answers to it. You know that Josh Rivera is going to read his Butler arguments and another a million other arguments. That's when you sit down and you write out answers or you think through answers to those same things. And once they're in a file, they're in a file. And it might be helpful to teammates and to other people if they can look at the file and be like, so these are the arguments that we want to sit on going into the next speech. Although I would say of the MO, MO can be one of the ex examples where people become most bogged down in becoming blog monsters. And it's like, yo dog, the MG is probably the most diverse thing in the debate round. Every MG is going to be mildly different. MO blocks are only going to answer one person, one at a time in most instances, particularly in such a line-by-line -line based activity. And certainly there are teams that have made a living and a career out of being great block monsters in the MO. I just don't understand it, but the MO is my least favorite speech. But the MO does want to be looking for blocking out extensions, making explanations on the top, stuff like that, the LOR. You're probably not going to write any blocks for the LOR, and if you are, well, that's some next level shit, and you should go give a lecture on that. I don't <laughs> really understand what blocks for the LOR would look like. Um, tips for improving the LOR, just because I uh, need to give you something here. I like to refer to the LOR as the used car salesman speech. It only matters, or the judge only wants to give you the ballot insofar as, or in as much as, you are pushing that off onto them. Make comparative claims. Open and close doors. I used to have quite a difficult time in reconciling the idea of opening and closing doors because I felt like I got competing opinions on that, which is to say that there's an importance of strategic concessions, but there is also the importance in... Um, you know, making sure that they don't have outs. Joe Provencher, who couldn't be here this morning, but will be here later, um, once said to me that I was doing my LORs all wrong because with the way I was doing it is I was directing him to all of the places that he could vote against me. And I guess that the happy medium between the two is not only directing in those places, but absolutely shutting down or explaining where. Um, I used to like, or where we're winning, I used to like to make jokes and the LOR, but uh, some people don't like you to make jokes, even if it is a silly and unnecessary 
four minute speech at times. Um, pretty good example of this that I will give, seeing a Ramsey here, is um, Pacific semifinals. Uh, I just made a lot of jokes in the LOR and was trying to keep it as lighthearted as possible. But uh, Jay Ram said to me that um, when he was giving LORs, or if he was giving LORs, because I think he gave the MO, um, he was saying that he would just be like, no way in hell they win in any capacity. Uh, I don't know, you can't really write blogs for the LOR, but what you can do is you can watch videos of yourself. Um, Will Chamberlain used to say in his judging philosophy, avoid repeatals. Um, I think that there are a couple of ways to avoid repeatals. One is to never be line by line. Two is to be as comparative as possible. I've always said or thought, based on what Phil Sharp once told me, LOR is two to three sentence explanation of why you win, and then continued uh, ramblings about uh, why that is so in comparing the claims that are made. Watch videos of yourself. You probably can't have blocks. PMR is probably a speech that you can have blocks for, but again, Parley is kind of diverse, so we'll see. I mean, watch videos of yourself. Watch videos of other people. In writing blocks, it's, it's funny to me, especially with some of the more scripted teams or the most prolific of block monsters, if you really did get a video of them, you could probably ascertain for yourself what their blocks look like and how you could, you know, type them up for yourself, things like that, all things submitted for your consideration. Is there any specific questions? <coughs> no question, class? No, okay. Yeah. Um, so, like, for the LOR, should we do no line-by-line -line analysis whatsoever? I mean... Is that what you're implying? There, there was a... Nice net benefits discussion a while back about how the MO, in theory, should be super, super line by line. And then I'm of the opinion that, I mean, yes, you're going to be pointing to specific arguments and you're going to be sitting on those, but remember, the judge has those arguments down. This is a time for comparative claims or assessments of the relative strength of those arguments. Like, uh, for example, it's like, on the disadvantage, there's not a lot of strong or compelling explanation for this, but we do have these two arguments here. It's not saying extend, it's we're winning because of these arguments, and that's like a repeated thing. We win because is a very continuous thing. No way you vote on this position without looking at these arguments. I mean, you'll point to specific arguments, but um, I'm of the opinion that the MO should be far more line by line. The exception to that would be what I was talking with some goons about last night, which is if you are reading a particularly nuanced position or a position that wasn't clarified as much as it should have been in the LO, then perhaps the MO needs to be a little more overview than they ordinarily would be so as to provide explanations about particularly nuanced positions. When B Silk and I would, and I guess it's, it's almost a little dirty, but it's not actually dirty because we had all of the warrants in there and it wasn't our fault if you weren't flowing or paying attention, but uh, we would read uh, this position called The Commonwealth by Hart and Nagory. And, um, such was the nature of our prep time and my slow handwriting that when I would read that shell, it was tremendously scripted, but it was also tremendously nuanced, and it came out super fast. Done with that in like four minutes, and um, judges like Nigel would say to us, you know, I think that the MO needs overviews in these cases because it's tricky, it's complicated. Not every judge is going to understand that position, and maybe in certain instances, and especially since you get the collapse, brief explanations are good, but leave the comparative proclamations to your LORs, in my opinion, because nothing's worse than being an LOR and feeling like you have to be a repeatal speech, if that helps to answer your question at all. Yeah. <clears throat> For the PMR, wouldn't you also want to do things like memorize uh, some extensions and like responses to responses? 
Yeah, but I would submit to you and everybody else, how often does a debate actually become that formulaic or boil down to that same thing? I mean, maybe if you're answering the same politics scenario again and again, you might have some clever lines that you like to repeat, but the nature of Parley is so <coughs> diverse, and I think that obviously some of the more block-inclined people within the community would have differing opinions on that, but I would ask you how many times in that last speech were you actually hosed because you didn't have a regurgitated script to read in that instance. Most PMRs or rebuttalists would have the skills to piece that together regardless. And at a certain point, if you're blocking that much or you're writing a PMR block for your partner, it's either going to look bad or, I don't know, you used to have a partner that would, uh, that was not B-Silk, that would write out a PMR overview for me before I got up there. And I'd have my own things to say, and it'd be like, man, this is really embarrassing. <sighs> and I once sarcastically said, after I read theirs, and now onto my overview. Um, so, I don't know, just be cognizant of those things and the ways in which Parley is diverse and unique in every round. Questions, please? Huh? Um, is there anything I could talk about here in the last 15 that is more of what you were expecting out of this lecture than what it was? Yeah. Maybe talk about uh, writing blocks together. I know you talked a little bit about it and stuff, but. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, writing blocks together or writing blocks as a team is pretty straightforward, you're compiling a database. I would imagine your team has a Dropbox or a Gmail or Evernote. You can take stuff that is already written, like Klaus has done with our files, and seek to build upon them or improve them, and you divide those duties up between you and partners, between you and teammates, if that's your homework or whatever, and then your responsibility as a debater would then become before the tournament taking the time to read those arguments and internalize those yourself, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of like dividing up duties, it almost kind of seems to like all put itself together, but maybe Denise Vaughn would assign you to write different things or specific things. And as you're all looking at things, hopefully you're far more healthy than some teams I know and you're sharing in the information process as you're going and determining what needs to be written, where are the strengths and relative weaknesses of that, and that just comes from looking at it and open dialogue between people, especially like your chitlins, letting them know ideally what you want and what should be in that. Uh, mm, Oh, funny video that maybe one of you all will stumble upon online sometime, UPS round of Zach Sheeta and uh, Rob Swanson debating a team from Long Beach. And Zach Sheeta drops the now infamous line, these are not the blocks you're looking for, because uh, they read the wrong blocks. And that's where being a block monster might get you into <coughs> some trouble down the road. In any case, um, main points wrapping up here. Write blocks, they'll make you stronger. Don't become too dependent on them. Your prep time can be stronger through memorization of these arguments. Nothing can compensate for creativity, but it's in block writing or going through the mundane that we're able to glean just maybe like a sliver of originality or creativity I mean, get lost in your block writing, get excited about writing about nuclear war scenarios, get excited about finding impact D, and it's amazing when you take just a little bit of interest in it, how you can then read the same arguments over and over again without ever having to write them down. And it's funny, after you have all those things memorized and after you've practiced it enough, it all comes out real fast, and making it efficient and making what you're writing efficient is what will put you ahead of other people. And the more that you take 
and interesting your own processes and your teammates' processes, the better off you'll be. Uh, yeah, there's like 10 minutes left and no more questions. Um, is this helpful? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, unrelated thing, if anyone wants to take a look at more block stuff later, I'm happy to do or show you what some of what I've had to write in the past looks like without making you sit and watch me kind of fumble around on the screen. Yeah. What's the easiest way to win Colin Patrick's ballot? Be af. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't think he's going to be doing too much judging anymore. Huh? Okay. How are you doing?